the family comes forward, would you join us in singing together, My Jesus, I Love Thee. may be seated. Well, I don't know if you can tell, but this is a celebration of life, a rejoicing in the promise and commitment of God. But if there is joy in the music here this morning, you can imagine the joy that was there in heaven when Helen Cron came home. Jesus told about poor Lazarus and that the angels called him and carried him to Jesus' side. The angels would have joyfully escorted Helen into the presence of Jesus and brought her to friends and family. And there because they were there because they had been told about Jesus. The psalmist says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Down here, that's a bit hard to understand. In heaven, there is the excitement that God has waiting for all of us to finally come home to the place that he has prepared for us. John wrote in Revelation, Blessed are the dead for who die in the Lord. They will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. Everything that Helen lived had its purpose in what has now begun for her in heaven. 
What is for us may be sorrow and loss is in heaven a great rejoicing. And we all long for that day when we too will find our place in heaven. And so Jesus said to his disciples and to all of us, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again so that where I am, there you may be also. And so we meet together here this morning to celebrate Helen's life. And thank you, friends, for coming and joining together with the family in this time of memory and in this time of rejoicing in the promises of God. Let's ask God to bless this service, shall we? Oh, Lord, how is it that we can find rejoicing as we gather together? how you can put into the hearts of family members that say, we want this to be a celebration. And Lord, it's because, because not only of what you have promised, but what you have done in our hearts, and we believe, and we rejoice with the hope that is ours because of what you have done for us. So Father, in this service, as we remember the life of Helen Cron. We pray, O oh God, that your name might be honored and glorified, that you would strengthen that hope that is within us. And we pray your blessing upon the family as they meet here to remember, and your blessing on the friends as they come to support the family. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our service is going to go unannounced, but we're going to begin with tribute to Helen Cron, and the family is going to come and do that for us this morning. How can one capture in several hundred words, a life well lived, it's impossible. But let me start with this story. On Tuesday evening, March, 17, March 7, while grandson James was gifting his grandma with one last music set on his organ, grandson Ryan came bouncing into her room, bent near her face, and with a twinkle in his eye that was clearly part mischief, said, Hi, Grandma. It's Ryan, your favorite grandson. The few of us present laughed out loud. And in that moment, what unbeknownst to us was only 12 hours before Mom transitioned from this world to the next, Ryan captured, in so, mu captured so much of who Mom was. Because as I see it, there isn't a single individual in mom's family who hasn't believed that she or he was her favorite. The message never given in words, but spoken so clearly by the twinkle in her eye, that unspoken look that was at least part mischief, which led to the secret knowing that there was something hugely and uniquely special in her relationship with you, and there was. My name, for those of you who don't know, is Bev Stobie. I am the middle daughter of Helen Cron, also a middle daughter. Helen, Hella to those who loved her first, sister, mother, grandma, great-grandma, was born in Pitt Meadows, B.C. on March 16, 1930, to the late Jacob and Anna Pankratz. Interestingly, Two-and-a-half-month-old David Cron, the future love of her life, along with his parents, docked in Halifax on that same day, fleeing the turmoil of Stalin's Russia. David met Helen in Abbotsford. She was an, she was an irresistible to dad, dark-haired, slender and fit, doe-eyed beauty. They married in 1954 when they were both 24. 
Because she was not considered the beauty of the family when she was growing up, I strongly suspect it must have been Dad's unending love for her that made her so. My eldest sister said it, my eldest sister Sandy said it perfectly in three words. I remember the moment clearly. It was at her old house, the one with the creek. Four of us sat waiting in the car for Mom, Dad, Sandy, Pat, and I. Jean had not yet arrived on the scene. We were off some place, perhaps church, perhaps a family gathering, perhaps a picnic. That part is unclear. But what remains perfectly clear is the vision of Mom in a tight-waisted, black and white, perfectly starched and ironed print dress, sashaying down the sidewalk, and then brightly and lightly flitting into the car. I don't think any of us, mom included, understood the beauty of the moment it was so innocent. Nor could we give it the just right words, but Sandy tried. And because she was school age and a little more worldly, her words were, mom, you're so sexy. <laughs> In that moment, she and her sisters could not know what that meant, but I had a heartfelt knowing it fit perfectly. Unfortunately, the perfection of the moment was quickly lost to the propriety of the moment, and regrettably, Sandy was quickly reprimanded for use of inappropriate, yet so appropriate, language. <laughs> we, Sandra born in 1955, me, Beverly, in 1958, Patricia born in 1961, and Jean in 1970, were the benefactors of the love mom shared with dad and he with her. Love they openly and frequently demonstrated to each other and to us. I will admit it was the secret delight of mine when I discovered that many of my friends had not seen kisses exchanged between their mommy and daddy as I had witnessed between mine. Helen would most readily be defined as a good person not a perfect person, which would surely deny her humanity, but a good person, a product of her temperament, culture, and her deeply held knowing that she was a child adopted by God through the sacrificial efforts of Jesus. She was much loved by her family. Her brothers adored her. Her sisters told her their secrets. Her mother valued her easygoing nature. And her father, well, he would take her hand in his and walk with her. Good, yes, but maybe even a bit goody-goody, I can recall thinking when she told me, perhaps after some naughtiness on my part, that she only got into trouble one time in all of her growing up years. <laughs> Apparently, this was not true of all of her siblings, and she went on to say <laughs> that some of them had a more difficult time meeting her mother's high expectations. I'll quickly add, though, that only recently I've learned to my great delight that at least one of Mom's apples did not fall far from the tree. <laughs> but speaking of expectations, Mom had many of herself. I chuckle and marvel when I recall how she, without fail, did her laundry on Mondays, saving and reusing the water from her wringer washer which reminds me, I'm quite certain that both Sandy and Pat can recall as I do that frightening moment when her fingers almost got pulled into the ringer before quick to respond, Mom threw it into reverse to ensure our little hands would be saved. And Tuesdays, well, that was ironing day. Even the sheets and the pillowcases were starched and ironed, sprinkled with droplets of water to create the appropriate steam, which in turn created that hard-pressed finish. I have a faint memory of her enthusiastic embrace of the new permanent press fabrics. So I think that although she performed these, ta these tasks without fail, she didn't much like them. Her preference was to tend the huge lawns and gardens and orchards filled mostly with apple trees, her favorite, all coaxed into being in beauty because of the innumerable hours spent outside. I remember the playgrounds of lawns for bicycles, ball games, trampolines, even golf and archery, and a summer wiener roast. The long grasses that surrounded our lawns, hiding the occasional, but occasional frightening garter snake. Her passionate use of the weed whacker after it was invented ensured her grandchildren would never be startled by a snake in the long grass again, because there was none. 
After mowing her lawns with her mowers, yes, she used more than one, she masterfully whacked those long grasses into oblivion. But I remember it was the slugs and not the snakes that were her real enemy. We children have a story to tell regarding her disposal system. I'll only say it didn't involve salt, and it was quick. <laughs> and it's impossible not to remember the vegetable gardens and the strawberries, raspberries, and currants that required endless cultivating, planting, watering, and weeding before the harvest. I remember that the many fruits, berries, and vegetables were not only made into winter preserves, but also provided a quick snack for hungry children and grandchildren. I think she derived particular pleasure when she watched her children and grandchildren gather around the plants, gleaning and eating what could be reached, all individuals leaving with stained red cheeks and fingers. It's hard to imagine it these days, but for many years she did not purchase what she could grow. She and Dad shared three homes together, and the gardens that filled the pantries of each became successively more beautiful. She was in her 79th year when, sad, when sadly it all became too much, and she moved to her second last home at the Garden Park Towers where she came to enjoy the community here in Chilliwack. Mom and Dad also had beef cattle, and at times in their early years, Dad, who was in the road building industry, was called to work out of town. During these times, Mom played the part of cattle farmer. She would take the shortcut through the bush on a 100-acre farm to the barnyard and feed the cattle and milk our one milk cow. Joan the Holstein was her favorite. I can remember her sadness when Joan left us. She was the source of innumerable gallons of milk and cream and pounds and pounds of butter. Mom's eldest three children could not believe their good fortune when her friend Esther introduced us to an electric butter churn. Years later, I came to learn it was one of her great delights when living as a widow on 16th Avenue, Pat and husband Grant would move a few of their cattle to her two and a half acre field behind her house. She loved to watch the slow, contented movements of the animals, taking special delight when their long, weed-whacking tongues did the work of trimming the long grasses surrounding the fence. Somewhere in her full days, Mom saved time for reading, and an avid reader she was. I have to wonder if it was because she read so much she learned how to write beautifully as well. In a few well-chosen words, she had the capacity to capture thoughts, wishes, and experiences and transfer them onto paper in most exquisite penmanship. It was one of the great sadnesses of her life that it was decided she'd had enough education at the end of her grade nine year. She loved school despite her shy and introverted nature. She had a few close friends whom she never forgot and whose mention always lit her face with delight and remembering. But perhaps she loved school most because it exposed her to the literature she loved. Throughout her life, she recited bits of this poem or that, one she'd memorized back in her childhood. Mom, in fact, had a great memory. It is altogether possible that her memory made school quite easy for her, although she could never quite get over the humbling experience of failing grade one, quietly acknowledging she'd never previously been exposed to English. But her memory, inherited as we know from her mother, was powerful and continues to be genetically sprinkled here and there in the children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren who succeed her. Ironically, it's her memory that first felt the impact of aging. The greatest sadness of Mom's life, though, was the sudden death of her husband after what was an altogether too short 37 years of marriage. His departure left a huge and permanent hole in her soft heart. Ironically, again, it was her dementia that made this pain a little more tolerable. Together they planned and adventured and created their dreams. They finally built the home they dreamed of in 1972. They took their children on a dreamed of vacation to Disneyland. They found their dreamed of community at a small rural church on Otter Road in South Langley and were one of its earliest and longest standing members participating in teaching and administrating duties faithfully serving with love. And they dreamed of and recreated their 100-acre woods and hills into a productive and profitable gravel extraction and manufacturing business, which in turn brought into reality their dream of providing well for their children. 
We all carry the image of mom sitting at the dining room table, the west-facing window at her back, and the multitude of books and bills meticulously organized and kept in front of her. She was largely a self-taught bookkeeper, using her years of experience as church treasurer to mastermind the financials of the family business. This was the beginning of a new era for our family. Although Sandy and I felt more keenly the impacts of the family's financially harsh years, mom and dad at first opportunity hired our young husbands and paid them well. And then as Jean grew a wee bit older, it was their supreme delight that he took to the business and the heavy aggregate machinery as well. His coming into their world was the icing on their cake. The dream of a son had too been fulfilled. The next years of life were a whirlwind of activity sprinkled with generous doses of fun. Holidays were added to the must-do lists. The family grew, adding sons-in-law and seven of mom's 11 grandchildren, the final four, were a special treat saved for later. I so vividly remember that the atmosphere in the home had become much more relaxed. Games were played. The growing family had many meals together with mom always at the helm in the kitchen, the table ever expanding, finally spanning two rooms. Pat, in particular, a fun-loving adolescent, brought incredible joy and laughter into the home. Her loving and agreeable spirit was a perfect balm for our parents' souls, especially after dad's near-fatal heart attack at 47. She, I believe, was a catalyst of change when values were recalibrated as mortality was acknowledged. We all reap the benefits of her gift to our family. We all reap the benefits of her gift to our parents. Together, she and Jean discovered and uncovered the playful parents who were waiting latent, and together they enjoyed some unforgettable holidays. Disneyland again, this time Jean was old enough to remember the experience, and Hawaii. Among other memorable travels, Mom and Dad enjoyed a Yellowstone Park adventure with Rick and Sandy and an excursion, if you could call it that, to Saskatchewan to rediscover the place of Dad's roots, which was also a special experience for Gene and his adventurous aunties and uncles cramped together in the tiny travel trailers of a former time and a final vacation to Palm Springs months before Dad prematurely left Mom at 62. I remember that mom ever regretted impulsively asking God for only another 12 years with dad after his first heart attack just so that Jean could have a father until he reached 20. She was given 14. And so with dad's death, mom entered yet another era, the recreation, some might say, of mom, a youngish and energetic widow. We remember these years. They were a combination of sadness for that which would never be and delight for the things that were and were still to come. Jean remembers the special times he and mom spent together soon afterward, richly cultivating that deep fondness they shared. He remembers they laughed a lot and went out for Chinese food once in a while, bought a car together, played cards in the evening, and just missed dad with each other. But perhaps and those who know mom would understand he gave her someone to cook for delaying the cornflakes for supper era by several years and so the years passed each family member making every attempt to include mom in their goings on for example sandy rick and their boys offered her ball games and babysitting and family vacations bev Lorne and their children offered her sheep shows rowing and high school concerts Pat and Grant offered her that great gift of stopping in on the way by and emergency help, and then Rachel, that precious gift of a second granddaughter who all but stole her grandma's heart. Jean and Vicki introduced mom to camp ministries at Pines, the, the delight of out-of-town company and twins with the addition of a final son one year later appeared to be triplets. Mom's final for grandchildren who, although they never knew the grandma who jumped on a trampoline, who loved to swim but sank quickly without her bright orange flippers, who loved her dogs, who chopped the wood to fuel her downstairs wood stove, knew the grandma that loved every one of her grandchildren as if they were her favorite. The grandma who received unending pleasure from their childhood antics and phone calls. 
who quietly watched art come out of the soul that needed to hum while creating. And it was in these years that the special relationship she cultivated with her in-laws came back to bless her. For her, the biological lines of family connections always disappeared, and her sons-in-law became her boys, and Vicky, well, who could not adore the woman who loved her son and stood by him with strength, love, and integrity? She, too, brought her laughter and her love for games into Mom's life. Grant, while he loaned Mom his cattle, was first on site when the basement flooded and generously treated Mom as his second mother. Lorne, while he gave her the gift of oatmeal together, a late breakfast visit after his weekly delivery of game birds to Langley, together they sh shared a love for her gardens and trees. And Rick, his big smile, quiet manner, and hospitable spirit, he, among other things, gifted Mom with his home for the final almost five years of her life, when dementia necessitated her final move. Together, he and Sandy sacrificially gave of themselves and their home to ensure she received good care and, more importantly, sacrificed just so Mom could always wake up to a familiar face, staying with and caring for her to the very end. Mom lived a full life, a good life. She blessed us, we blessed her. Although there is never quite enough time together, as I see it, we had the luxury of keeping her until she was all used up. And so, just before Kathy sings, and, for, and following that, four of Mom's grandsons come and give you a taste of their experience with her. Permit me one small moment, my daughter, Tootsie, as Mom called her, shared with me. She messaged the day after Mom passed away. The words I read went like this. K, for Keegan, her, her six-year-old middle son, just prayed, Dear Jesus, help great-grandma to have a good time in heaven with you. I chuckled out loud as I enjoyed the visual, knowing that deep and eternal truths are given children to deliver in the simplest of ways. shall unfold preparing his entrance the stars shall applaud him with thunders of praise The sweet light in his eyes shall enhance those awaiting and we shall
Thank you, Angie Bev, for your tribute. I had no idea that I wasn't the favorite. <laughs> uh, Grandma was a, a steady presence and just always there uh, for us and our family. Some of my favorite uh, memories, uh, earliest memories, were at Grandma and Grandpa's. I, I learned to ride my bike there on that big green grass that she had uh, up on the mountain. All we had was rocks. Uh, and. Grandma had a kissy blanket, a, a flannel blanket that I got to uh, go to sleep uh, in, in their bed when mom and dad wanted to stay later at their house. Uh, and every time I, I left grandma and grandpa's house, I would cry because I didn't want to leave. And it seemed like every time grandma would have a freshly made bun for me uh, to have on the way home that I could pull out the middle and eat it while it was still warm. Uh, but I could always make her cry. I sat beside her and Grandpa in church every Sunday growing up, and I learned to sing harmony from him. And after he passed away, and uh, a song with four-part harmony would come up, uh, she would cry. Uh, when I sang Grandpa's part. I know she loved it though. We teased her about it though, because she would cry too whenever she would ask my dad or one of my uncles to pray for a meal at family, family gatherings. She always had a soft heart and we'll miss her. Thinking about Grandma, back about Grandma, I. I don't think too much about the past five years. I think about all those years we had with her before that. And um, again, like Auntie Bev said, each of us felt like we were her favorite. Um, um, there, when she made us feel so special and so important, and. Um, so much so that she even had a few nicknames for us. Um, Richard, she called Richie. Um, she had Scotty. Um, one that was so special was Tootsie, and it was so special that she had a second one. And then again, because I thought I was the favorite, the best nickname was AB Baby. And I had people that tried to use that to make fun of me for a silly name, but whenever they would say it, I know that I was loved and I knew where that love came from. Um, I'll always remember in kindergarten as half days coming over this after school was over and going over to grandma's house and again feeling so special because I don't even remember Trisha or Carl be ever being there. <laughs> we were always so important to her. Yeah. I'll remember those times too because to this day I still cannot eat scrambled eggs without sugar. <laughs> um, the other way I always saw her love and saw her smile and her kind gestures, jests towards us would be when I came back from Germany uh, and going to Bible school there and going to Bible school in Texas I, I didn't cut my hair for almost two years and my hair got longer than James's is at right now. And she would always, before going home, she would always call me down to the door and her down, going down the stairs, she always had the pictures of all her grandchildren at the graduation pictures and she would point to mine and say, 
Now, isn't that a handsome looking boy right there? <laughs> and so, one last time for Grandma. I know we saw some wonderful pictures up there of James, and wasn't he a handsome boy right there? <laughs> so, we loved her, and she will just not be forgotten. Um, I was thinking of like, what is one character that I could talk about of grandma's? And I couldn't help but think about generosity. Like, uh, 1983, uh, 1986, mom went back to work, so then I was three, and grandma was my primary caregiver. And so she gave me three years. I say, like, we were had this discussion, who's, which of the grandkids spent the most time with grandma? I think it was me, Richard thinks it's him, Kevin thought it was him, but definitely not him because he's the middle child and he went to school and mom was caring for him when I was a baby, so it's definitely not Kevin. But like, grandma was so generous with her time. Um, like she, besides watching me before I entered kindergarten and then watching me while I was in kindergarten, she was my Sunday school teacher. And then, then she was generous with her means. Uh, as a supported missionary, grandma's always one of the first people on my support list of monthly supporters, and growing up as a teenager, we had to learn this very specific sentence. No grandma, especially when she circled the table trying to fill our plates. Like, no grandma. She was like so generous that she, she's like, has this food, she doesn't want to go to waste, and she just wants to give it away. And, uh, and she, like, and when I came home from Japan, she wanted to hear my stories, and then even in this last fall, like, this is so grandma. She, like, her generosity was, oh, Sandy's finished eating. I have this little bit of food left. Oh, here, have my food. And we'd have to go, no, grandma, that is your food for you. That's all you get to eat. And so grandma was this generous person with her time and her love. And, and, and she, she just, she wanted to give, and like she was so happy when we would come and visit, and she'd just drop her thing and just give us her attention. And, and that's what I want to remember about Grandma, is her generosity and Jean tricking her to bake buns for her own birthday. <laughs> like, like, that's how generous she is. She'll, Jean, Jean asked, and she did it, and that's just something I'll remember about Grandma. Hi, my name is David Cron. I am one of Grandma Cron's grandsons. Jean Cron is my dad. My favorite memory of Grandma is when we were having a family gathering at Christmas time upstairs at Garden Park Tower. Grandma and I were sitting on the couch together and she took the time to visit with me. There were lots of other people there, but she especially took the time to visit with me. Sometimes, when gra oh, there were lots of people there, but she especially took the time to visit with me and talk with me. She always took time for me. Sometimes when Grandma was even visiting with others in a room, and if I looked at her, she would always give me a big smile and almost giggle with me. Grandma was always smiling and friendly. She always made me feel special. I will miss her very much. I'm Sandy Friesen, the oldest child, and yes, I too was mom's favorite. <laughs> or so I thought until Beverly divulged otherwise in her tribute. Dad and mom were godly parents. They loved Jesus, faithfully served, and exemplified what it meant to follow Jesus. Of course, this meant we went together as a family to Sunday school and participated in the worship service on Sunday morning and Sunday evening. Midweek, we, did, we didn't miss kids' clubs, choir, or youth, and every manner of meetings and special events throughout the year. I don't recall, every, I don't recall we ever complained. This was just what the Crown family did. Even after my dad passed away 25 years ago, Mom continued to faithfully worship every Sunday, participate in midweek studies, and faithfully served 
whenever an opportunity arose. I'm so grateful for my Christian heritage. I pray that God finds each of us faithful in passing this on to the next generation. And so today we reflect on the past and celebrate Helen Cron. Thank you for taking the time to celebrate our mom with us today. Your love and support, kind words and encouragement mean so much as we grieve the loss of our mother. My mom, Helen Cron of Abbotsford, BC, was ushered through the gates of heaven into the presence of her Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, on March 8, 2017, just eight days prior to her 87th birthday. Mom was born to Jacob and Anna Pankritz on March 16, 1930 in Pitt Meadows, the fourth of six children. She grew up and worked hard alongside her family throughout her life on several properties in Abbotsford. Mom often made reference to the apple farm on Glen Mountain where she and her siblings walked through the apple orchard filling their lunch buckets on their way to school. Thus, her love of apples, her favorite fruit, which naturally led to her mastering and serving delicious home-baked apple pies. In her mid-teens, the family relocated to Gladwin Road, just north of South Fraser Way, where the Sandman Hotel is currently located here in Abbotsford. She completed grade nine at Philip Sheffield School, and as a young adult, she worked as a clerk at Modern Markets. On June 15, 1954, Helen married David. They settled on 100 acres on 8th Avenue in Aldergrove, where they raised their four children, myself, Sandra, born in 1955, Beverly in 1958, Patricia in 1961, and Eugene in 1970. Mom loved her family and extended family. She served with a willing and loving heart, opening their home to many family gatherings for a wiener roast or a barbecue with potato salad and fresh home-baked buns. She not only cared for her home and family well, she enjoyed her garden, fruit trees, and acres of lawn mowing. She had the meticulous ability to mow the lawn in such a way so us girls could work alongside her to rake the acres, or so it seemed, of grass and wheelbar wheelbarrow it to the field for the cattle. She loved her church family of South Otter, later renamed Hillside Community in Aldergrove, and Clearbrook MB in Abbotsford, and faithfully served in her church. It gave her much joy when her friends called her, came over for a visit or stopped to chat with her, especially after Dad passed away, when it was not as common to go and meet friends for coffee. In 1969, Dad and Mom sold a five-acre parcel of their property with the creek running through the front yard and the original house with only an outhouse. Dad and Mom were so proud to build us a new house on 8th Avenue with our first indoor toilet. The, year my son the next year, my brother Gene was born. In 1972, just two years later, Dad and Mom began as owner-operators of their successful gravel business, Cron Gravel and Contracting, and on their property. Dad ran the equipment, and Mom maintained a clean set of accounting records for nearly 20 years until Dad retired. In the early 1980s, they moved to Five Acres on 16th Avenue, a home which they renovated and re-landscaped the yard not long before Dad passed away. Mom remained there until her move into a condo in Abbotsford in 2006. As her health declined, her last moon was into our home in 2012 with Rick and I, where Mom enjoyed having company all day and the familiarity of her surroundings. As her mobility declined, she enjoyed listening to Clearbrook MB Church weekly services produced on DVD. Rick and I are truly grateful that we had the privilege of caring for Mom in our home right to her last day. She passed away peacefully at home. Helen is predeceased by her parents, Jacob and Anna Pankratz, brothers Herman in infancy and Harry, sisters Anne Sawatsky, Luella Dick, and in 1992, David, her husband of 38 years. Mom will be deeply missed by her family. Sandy and her husband Rick, Richard and Christy Friesen, their children Andrew, Brett, Isaac, and Lexi Jo. Ryan and Joanne Friesen and their children, Joshua, Adam, and Lucas. Kevin and Julie Friesen and their children, Owen, John Michael, Wilson, Nathaniel, and Clark. Carl and Christina Friesen. Beverly and her husband, Lauren Stobie, and their children, Darren and Trisha Dick. Jonah, Keegan, and Elijah. Tom and Alicia Stobie and baby George. James Stobie and Joy. Brent and Pat Fritzke and Rachel, Jean and Vicki Cron, David, Mitchell and Austin, 
brother Jake Pankratz and in-laws Wilma Pankratz, Peter Sawatsky, Mary Cron, Bill and Marie Giesbrecht, Jake and Helen Esau, and many extended family. We'd like to invite you to sing a couple of well-known gospel songs that look forward to our heavenly home. And if you are comfortable, perhaps you'd like to stand as we sing together. If you prefer to stay seated, that's, that's up to you. The first song is, Oh, That Will Be Glory For Me. If you're comfortable remaining standing, we're going to sing together, When the Roll is Called Up Yonder.
Thank you. Please be seated. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. What a glorious song of confidence. You know, the description of heaven that we have falls way short of what it will really be. I often say it's no more than a child in the womb could understand what's going to happen outside of the womb. And it's going to be even more than that. All we know is that God has a dwelling place to which he invites us if we will put our trust in him. And that dwelling place can hardly be adequately described in our words and even in our ideas. King David wrote a song about the dwelling place of God. And when he wrote this, I think he had three things in mind. This is Psalm 84. Let me read part of that psalm. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young in a place near your altar. O oh, Lord Almighty, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. I think, first of all, David was thinking about the tabernacle that he worshipped in. It was a very simple place, but it was something that he had a recognition of the presence of God. And I think maybe what he was thinking of was the vision that he had of the kind of temple that he wanted to build for his God. He knew that his son was going to build it, but he was preparing all of the material for this. And just like we do when we're building our house and we're getting everything together and we see the plans and everything, and we're looking, we're imagining what that's going to be like. And I think when David wrote this psalm, he was just thinking about that great place where God would be dwelling and he would go to be there to meet his God. I think, secondly, David was looking ahead to heaven as well to recognize the place that God was preparing for him. And as we have said several times today already, your mom, your grandma is there in the place that God has prepared. And we read that God is the light. The light that is there is God. And it's not going to be a light of anything that we recognize as we read that story in the Bible. It is simply everything is light because God is there. And the love of God is just overwhelming. It just, it's the air that we breathe as we are there in the presence of God there in heaven. And we know there's no more pain, no more tears. And everything that that represents is done. It's over. It's a perfect place. I think there's a third thing that David was thinking about when he wrote this song. I think David was describing his longing to be in the presence of God no matter where. In fact, in the temple, there was no greater thing. It was just a building. What made, it, what made it special was God was there. In heaven, what makes it a place to want to be at? God is there. And David, we know that he loved the out of doors. And he wrote so many psalms that were there from the out of doors. And for him, the dwelling place of God where God's presence was. And he said, I just love to be there. He said, my soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. He just wanted to be 
where God was. And that's what all of eternity is about. In fact, when David wrote Psalm 23, the last verse that he wrote, he wrote with confidence in God. As he's writing it, he's still alive, but he's looking forward to what's going to happen where your mom is right now. And he wrote and said, Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We long for that day. We long for the reality of that even now, today, as we are there in the presence of this amazing, loving God who makes us ready to go home to be with him. Even as, he con even as we continue life here, we wait for that eter eternal dwelling place that he has here for us. And while we are here, we long for the wonderful presence of God. And that's what gives us confidence to be able to sing when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. And someone has taken that last verse in Psalm 23 and put it to music. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Kathy, let's sing that. James. Let's sing together. A pilgrim was I and a wandering In the cold night of sin I did grow When Jesus the kind shepherd found me
the days of my life. Folks, our eternal hope is in our Lord. And we thank you, friends, for coming and sharing this time together with the family. You are invited to join them for refreshments and a time of fellowship with the family in the fellowship hall downstairs. Um, I am told that there will be a table that is gluten-free and you look for the yellow blanket on the table. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then there are, <laughs> there are uh, we will have grace here before we uh, leave and so when you come downstairs you may just uh, um, move right through and pick up your food and go to the tables and then have the opportunity to visit with each other and with the family. And the ushers will show you the directions. Let's bow together to pray. Father, again, how can we say thank you enough for the hope and confidence that you give us? Lord, you have promised us eternal life, dwelling with you. And that's why we can sing today. That's why we can rejoice as we remember the life of the one that you've taken home to be with you. And we have the confidence, Lord, that we too shall come as we put our trust in you. Lord, I pray your special blessing upon this family. They have such a wonderful, godly heritage. And Lord, I pray that you might help them to be faithful to that heritage that they have received and pass on that commitment and understanding of who you are and what it means to follow you. And Lord, for, for the family, the grandchildren, the great-grandchildren, there will be times when they just wish they could be with Grandma once again. And I pray that you, Lord, will give them your comfort, that at times like that they will remember her life and what she meant to them and how she served you so faithfully. And Lord, may they also remember that you are a God who loves and cares and is worth following. And so we pray your special blessing upon them. And now, Lord, we also join together for fellowship, and we pray that you'll bless our visiting together and bless the food that has been prepared for us. And Lord, may we again um, just remember your, your blessing upon Helen Cron's life. And now may the Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal comfort and a wonderful hope, comfort you and strengthen you in every good thing you do and save. In Jesus' name, amen. Ushers, please.